The following program is made possible by friends and partners of the Quick Study Television Ministry. Thank you for your support. He was known as God's angry man. Many shunned him away because he was a simple farmer, but he was powerful. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Him. I'm Janice. And I'm Corey. And this is the Quick Study Television Program. Thank you for joining us. As we go through the Bible in one year, we land on the prophet called Amos. Now, the, he's called God's angry man by many Bible scholars, but he was right and he was truthful. And while he was a simple farmer of sycamore trees and a sheep herder, his words were powerfully and powerfully attached to God's divine mind. We'll talk about that coming in a moment as we focus on faithful wounds. Now, what does that mean? Amos is striking out, but he's doing so because he is trying to make ancient Israel faithful to God again. All right, we now have Bible archaeology to augment our studies, Corey. Well, in Amos chapter 6, Amos is really talking about the extravagance of the capital city of northern Israel, which is Samaria. He calls it the Hill of Samaria. So you and I are going to be exploring that ancient hill. That very city mm -hmm. was uh, opposite of what God commanded in the first place mm -hmm. in Deuteronomy very because true. they built that city and God said, I don't want you building cities. Move into the cities that have already been built. Very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Bible Discovery TV Challenge. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to meeting Amos. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So, who was the priest of Bethel during Amos' time? Was that Amaziah, Jeroboam, or Amos? It's a good question, and that also is the way they mark history, the priest and the prophets. Right. Let's study on. Portions of the Bible were not translated into English until the 7th century AD. Even then, it wouldn't be until the 15th century that a full English Bible would be present. Therefore, bishops in the church would hire artists and commission them to paint and draw images with specific Bible verses underneath them in order to create teaching tools for the church. This was very offensive to the Orthodox Jews since they understood the second commandment of the Ten Commandments to mean never to make an image in any form of God or His Word. But by the 5th through the 7th century, the church leaders had prevailed. We know these ancient art booklets as Florilegia, which is from a Latin word that means little booklets. Amos prophesied during the days of King Uzziah in southern Judah and King Jeroboam II in northern Israel. Now this means that he was a contemporary prophet. He was around at the same time as Isaiah and Hosea, just to name a couple of the major ones. Now um, in Amos chapter 6, Amos is prophesying specifically against the capital city of Samaria and he's, and he's talking about their decadence, their ivory couches. Right now you and I are going to explore ancient Samaria. The city of Samaria was the capital city of the northern kingdom of Israel for many years. The city was founded by King Omri after he purchased the land, recorded in 1 Kings. The name Samaria means mountain of watching. Archaeological findings of wine and oil presses, manufacturing areas, and large cisterns reveal that the site was likely a large agricultural center. The Bible reports that King Omri built on the hill of Samaria. 
in the early 1900s, Omri's palace complex was unearthed at the very top of the Hill of Samaria. Its foundation is the rock of the mountain, carved away to create a 13-foot high platform. Two chambers have also been discovered underneath the floors of the palace that probably served as the tombs of King Omri and his infamous son, King Ahab. The city of Samaria was destroyed by invading Assyria in 722 BC, recorded in 2 Kings 17. A major change for the ruined city came in 30 BC when it was given to Herod the Great by the Emperor of Rome, Augustus. Herod renamed Samaria Sebast, a Greek word that means Augustus. At the top of the summit, right over the ruins of Omri and Ahab's palace, Herod built a temple to worship Augustus. Well, in AD 66, the city was finally destroyed by Rome itself. Today, it seems as if the land has rejected its sordid past. It is an almond orchard, dotted here and there with ancient stone markers of a very different time. You know, it's true. We, we are tempted to believe that doing religious things would appease the God of the Bible. On the contrary, doing religious things for the sake of religion actually angers a covenant God. Rules and rights have a way of being configured so that they would ease the conscience of men rather than satisfy and please the covenant God. So Amos is the farmer prophet that brings forth the truth about God's opinion of all the religious things that Judah and ancient Israel have done. When Habakkuk prophesied that the just shall live by faith, it was faith in the covenant God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not faith in religious trinkets. Amos 9, verses 1 through 6. I saw the Lord standing by the altar, and he said, Strike the doorposts, that the thresholds may shake, and break them on the heads of them all. I will slay the last of them with the sword. He who flees from them shall not get away, and he who escapes from them shall not be delivered. Though they dig into hell, from there my hand shall take them. Though they climb up to heaven, from there I will bring them down. And though they hide themselves on top of Carmel, from there I will search and take them. Though they hide from my sight at the bottom of the sea, from there I will command the serpent, and it shall bite them. Though they go into captivity before their enemies, from there I will command the sword, and it shall slay them. I will set my eyes on them for harm and not for good. The Lord God of hosts, he who touches the earth and it melts, and all who dwell there mourn, all of it shall swell like the river and subside like the river of Egypt. He who builds his layers in the sky and has founded his strata in the earth, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth, the Lord is his name. Amos chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. Now over the weekend, we have introduced the prophet Joel and taught through the prophet Joel on the Walk television program. And if the television station you're watching us on does not air the walk, then go to our website at BibleDiscoveryTV.com and look for the Walk television program. We focused on Joel and we introduced Amos. So today, on this day, we're going to pick up Amos, God's angry man. It's one of my favorite prophets. Not, not because he's angry, but because he's angry about the right things. He's not angry about the wrong things. And I love Amos. Now, we're going to study today on something called faithful wounds. Now, most people think wounds are bad. Never get hurt. Never do anything. You know, just never get wounded. But let me tell you something. The Bible says deceitful are the kisses of an enemy, enemy but faithful are the wounds of a friend. In other words, there are wounds that we have to wear in order to find the truth. 
because that's the way this world is in the current sin condition of the world. And so Amos is prophesying to ancient Israel, who's very prosperous financially, by the way, and he's prophesying to Judah, who is also prospering financially, by the way, but they don't know the truth. So financial prosperity doesn't tell you anything about truth. Now we go to Amos chapter 9, verse 1, and it says this, I saw the Lord standing by the altar, and he said, Strike the doorpost, that the thresholds may shake, and break them on the heads of them all. I will slay the last of them with the sword. He who flees from them shall not get away, the Bible continues, and he who escapes from them shall not be delivered. Now, let me just say that in this time, Israel was wrapped up into her religiosity and the worship of the temple. Religious icons and rituals and objects of worship will never protect the rebellious from the heart of God's corrective judgment. Understand that God's judgment is corrective. And I want to remind you of the verse that nobody ever preaches on these days. It's the verse that nobody ever wants to preach on these days when Peter says, let judgment begin at the house of God. <laughs> nobody wants to preach on that because it doesn't get ratings. And it doesn't invoke people to support you with money. And it doesn't make you popular to go on Fox News or wherever. So, but the Bible says, let judgment begin at the house of the Lord. In other words, get the truth into my house, God's house. So Amos is prophesying to God's people in these ancient times. And the Bible says that God is coming in to provide discipline to his people. Now, God doesn't expect the people who reject him to know the truth, but he does expect the people who accept him to know the difference between truth and lies. Amos chapter 9, verse 2 and 4 say, Though they dig into hell, from there my hand shall take them. Though they climb up to heaven, from there I will bring them down. And though they hide themselves on top of Carmel, from there I will search and take them. Though they hide from my sight at the bottom of the sea, from there I will command the serpent and, I shall, and it shall bite them. Though they go into captivity before their enemies, from there I will command the sword and, I, and it shall slay them. And I will set my eyes on them for harm and not for good. Wow. Well, that's not very nice, is it? Well, it's not very nice when we ignore God as God's people and we basically blaspheme the whole lifestyle, living like the devil. So you see, beloved, the second power connection is the divine discipline of God cannot be escaped. But it is healing and corrective discipline that changes us forever. This idea, people will read, you know, passages from Amos and they'll say, see how angry God is? See how evil God is? And this is totally out of context. If you read the whole passage, you begin to understand that, the, that God's people during this time would not listen to anything else. They were hypnotized by their own love for self. They were hypnotized by their own prosperity. They wouldn't listen to anything else. So God had to move in and strike. And when he did, they repented. Amos chapter 9, verses 5 and 6 say, The Lord God of hosts, he who touches the earth and it melts, and all who dwell there mourn, all of it shall swell like the river and subside like the river of Egypt. He who builds his layers in the sky, that's God building the atmosphere, and has founded the strata in the earth, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth, the Lord is his name. God has to tell Israel, ancient Israel, ancient Israel in that rebellious time has to tell them who he is. God always attaches his holy name to his holy discipline. God loves those he disciplines and he disciplines those he loves. Beloved, let me just say that if we think God is this malevolent, evil dictator trying to squash you, you have a wrong view of God. That is not the correct view of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish and have everlasting life. But there are times in our life it's called, in modern vernacular, an intervention. There are times in our life when we are so addicted to ourselves, when we are so addicted to our lifestyles, when we are so addicted to our ideas, we can't see anything else. So we hurt those around us, and we ruin our witness. We become addicted to our own lifestyles and addicted to our own selves. So God has to bring an intervention, and that's exactly what the judgment of God is. 
It's an intervention. It's a waking up. It's God's megaphone, as my dear friend Dr. Chuck Misler says. God's pain is God's megaphone to get our attention. And so may I say today that in our worldview of God, in our understanding, God always begins with those who are called by His name, those who say they're Christians. Let judgment begin here in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not out on the street, not in all the parades that happen. Not, you know, put your signs away. Get rid of your signs. Stop that stuff. Knock that stuff off. God wants us to know Him. And you know, when we know God and when we repent in the church and when we love God, there'll be no need for signs because all we need to do is live our life and it will be a witness. It will be a sign without of all this other stuff. The prophet Amos was prophesying mostly to the northern kingdom of Israel. And there's even a point in the book where they tell him to go down to southern Judah. Now, Amos is prophesying during the reign of King Uzziah, who's down in southern Judah, and uh, King Jeroboam, who's up in northern Israel. Now, this is the second king that is named Jeroboam. This King Jeroboam is Jeroboam, the son of Jehoash. But he is, uh, he is expanding uh, pagan religious practices that were actually set up by Jeroboam I, who was way back in the time of Solomon's son Rehoboam when the kingdom of northern Israel actually split into two. That, is, that one is Jeroboam the son of Nebat. Newly selected King Jeroboam ruled over his ten tribes from the city of Shechem he quickly began to fear that he would lose his unsure hold on Israel if he allowed the people to travel back to Jerusalem. It was in Rehoboam's territory that they were to offer their sacrifices and honor the Lord's commands. Jeroboam instituted replacements, two golden calves that he set up in so-called high places, one at the city of Bethel, and another at Dan. Bethel has not yet been excavated and examined, but extraordinary finds at Dan stand as a stark reminder of Israel's sin against God. A large high place has indeed been found. Stairs lead up to its man-made platform that stands 10 feet high. Here, Somewhere on this platform at Dan, the idol would have stood. Remnants of many sacrificed animals were found, along with the horned altars that they would have been sacrificed on before a golden image of one of their own. Various cultic utensils and smaller incense altars were scattered around in abundance. The discoveries here at Dan clearly illustrate what the Bible portrays. In the month of September, Quick Study TV offers unique and inspiring Bible commentary on the 12 minor prophets and the four major prophets in the Bible. The late Dr. Ron Hembry brings us closer to the world in which they ministered, revealing amazing unknown facts about the truth of their prophecies and how they affect us today. Now, all of this commentary and more are offered in audio MP3 format this month on an exclusive, beautiful USB key drive. It fits into your computer, your carport, even CD players with USB supports. You can save the files to your computer, copy them to your MP3 player, iPod, iPad, or iPhone. And this beautiful key drive featuring the audio teaching of Dr. Ron Hembry on the Prophets is our special gift to you this month for a suggested donation of $25 or more. When you participate in giving to Quick Study Television, you're keeping us broadcasting. So all donations are used for the production of Quick Study TV and the Bible Guide and many other teaching tools. Thank you in advance for your much-needed gift. To send, send to P.O. Box 150, Marysville, Pennsylvania, 15668 The phone number is 
in Canada and the rest of the world, send to P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. And our phone number is 519-940-8338. In the historical Exodus, God uses strange and dramatic imagery to express his presence among his people. But to the ancients, the imagery was not so strange or distant. In Exodus chapter 13, verse 21, it tells us that God's presence led the wandering Israel by a cloud of smoke by day and fire by night. This sign is actually mentioned 10 times in the Tanakh or the Old Testament. The symbol of fire meant the same in the time of Exodus as in the time of Abraham in Genesis 14 when God made a covenant with him passing between the sacrifices as a burning fire. Burning fire was a significant sign of covenant. In fact, when covenants were made with fire, common knowledge knew that God's presence was there. And if there was any wavering or doubt in a covenant one would make, one would simply point to a burning fire or a lamp and claim... That is my witness. This is the reason that the lampstand was consistently burning in the tabernacle of Moses and the temple of ancient Israel. Quick Study TV presents Good Friends Fellowship Sunday services with the teaching of the word great worship and fellowship in the chat room. You're invited to join Pastor Rod and Janice online at Good Friends Fellowship every Sunday. Services begin at 11 a.m. Eastern at www.biblediscoverytv.com. Remember to follow the links to Good Friends Church Services. authentic Bible believer wears the wounds of spiritual warfare and the discipline of God's spirit. But you know, wounds change us forever. Wounds train us, teaches us. By the grace of God, the wounds of Jesus Christ, well, it keeps us from the damage and the pillage of Satan's forces. And this, I think, is what Isaiah had in mind when he prophesied he, Jesus, was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquity and by his stripes we are healed. Now, the wounds and the stripes that we have encountered now can be healed because of Jesus. He can heal our spirit and our soul in the process. The prophetic ministry of Amos would come true. Israel would fall to Assyria, Judah to the Babylonians. The temple was destroyed. But God's people eventually were healed. Interesting. Now it's time for the Bible IQ question. From chapters in Amos 6 through 9, who was the priest of Bethel? Amaziah, Jeroboam, or Amos? I believe that the priest of Bethel was Amaziah. You're right, because Jeroboam was Was the the king king of Israel and Amos was the prophet. prophet. (laughs) Yes, yes. Very good. (laughs) These are interesting names. Mm -hmm. Uh, And all of these prophets, and some of them are identified where they're from, like Micah, Mm-hmm. Or Shereth, and others mm-hmm. are identified by whose son they are. That's right. Yes. Uh, and so each one has its reason. But we write a Bible commentary to go with this program, and it's in a booklet form called the Quick Study Bible Guide. A lot of people are not aware of this, but we have 12 guides each month throughout the year, going from Genesis to Revelation. And so what we're doing here, in fact, here's your assignment, Corey. You did it yesterday. Let's do it again. Okay. Here on the inside cover, to give you one example, the Bible that, timeline. There we go. <laughs> now, the Bible timeline is there to show you where the kings are in place and so on. But in August and September, we also did another one. We do these about every quarter. And this one is the biblical prophets in their times. And so you have the prophets identified here on the timeline where they're at. So the idea is that the Bible guides help you understand what we're reading and put something in your hands. So if you would like to become a supporter of this ministry, 
Every month, we're going to send you one of these quick study Bible guides automatically as you support us on a regular basis. By the end of the year, you'll have 12 of them. That's right. Mm -hmm. So you'll have the whole deal. Now, guess what? Next year in 2013, we're going to do it all over again. We mm -hmm. are. Next year's Bible guide is going to be dedicated to wisdom, and it's called Wise Guys. They're brand new. They're brand Every new. Year. Every year's brand new. But this one is dedicated to power, God's power in His Word. So if you would like to become a regular partner with the ministry, giving in any amount, uh, then please do so. Now, what I do want to remind you of as well is that the discovery letter comes with that. Mm -hmm. And so the discovery letter is, is every month has articles in there. But also check this out. This is uh, the USB key. Now, this USB key, many people will know, goes into a computer, has MP3 files on it. Mm -hmm. For this month only, in the month of September, we have put together all of my father, the late Dr. Ron Hembry's audio files uh, introductions and commentary on the prophets. Mm -hmm. Every prophet of the Bible that we're reading through right now. It's in audio form on this USB key and for a gift of $25 we'll send it to you. Now when we say that we're asking you to please consider that. Uh, a suggested donation because it the, the USB drive is uh, you know, it is expensive. It does cost us money uh, to get it to you. And so we encourage you to join us today. Become one of the 500 people to help us as we broadcast now on some new stations and new time slots. Thank you in advance for praying for us and considering that. Here is Watch and Pray. Now, I was thinking about this because the prophet Amos is pretty hard on ancient Israel. He's pretty hard on ancient Judah. But Isaiah said, Jesus was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity. The punishment for our sin was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. You see, God has to judge sin. And so he placed all of that judgment for sin upon Jesus Christ on the cross. That's what made the cross so significant. Christianity and believers recognized their sin and that had to be dealt with at the cross. That's why there are many crosses and it's part of the symbolism of Christianity. But notice the cross is empty now because Jesus rose from the dead. And when he rose from the dead, he made provision for eternal life. So if we come to Christ according to what the Bible says and we give our lives to him and we pray and say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need a savior and I believe you're the savior. I take you as my Lord, forgive me of my sin. Help me today. He will do it. Thank you for watching to everybody on Sun Broadcasting in Albuquerque, New Mexico. What a great network. What a great station. I'd like to remind you that if you would like to find out more about our ministry and enroll in our new Bible Discovery Seminary, go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com. That's BibleDiscoveryTV.com.